everybody. Welcome to the next interview with AATRN, the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Uh, applied Topology is a research area with a strong sense of community, and we've been working hard to keep it that way during the pandemic and now after the pandemic, if you, uh, if you feel like we are after it. So thanks to all of you for joining. So within our community, we have a lot of knowledge, not only about research, but also about professional development. And the goal of this interview is to hear, learn from, and celebrate our community's stories. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce the interviewer. So our interviewer today, uh, i.e. the person asking the questions, is Dr. Steve Udeau of INRIA and the Ecole Polytechnique. So he received his PhD in 2005 under the supervision of uh, Dr. Jean-Daniel uh, Boissonna at the Ecole Polytechnique. His work and contribution to the fields of applied topology has been foundational and far-reaching, not to mention his earlier work in computational geometry. This contribution includes two seminal books on persistence theory, which have been a great boon for young researchers entering the field, and many highly cited works on stability and structure in persistence theory, multi-parameter persistence invariance, applications of persistence to clustering, shape analysis, metric geometry, introduction of optimal transport techniques to applied topology, top topological optimization of inverse problems in many other areas. More personally, uh, Steve was my PhD thesis advisor, although whether or not this was to the benefit of the community is not for me to say. Steve is a longtime collaborator of Dr. Chazal, and we thank him for hosting our interview today. Well, thank you very much, Hanan, for the very nice introduction. And hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to host Frédéric Chazal today. Uh, so those of us who know him well usually call him Fred. So if you allow me, I will stick to this habit during the interview. So Fred, hello, how are you? Hello, Steve, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm fine, and uh, I'm very happy and honored to, to start this uh, new series of uh, ITRN uh, interviews. Yeah, before I start, like that, that's a nice picture you have in the background. So is this, is this your boat that is shown in the picture? Yeah, yes, this is my boat, and uh, this is a place where I spend my uh, summer break. So this is one of my uh, passion. I'm passionate by uh, wind sailing, and uh, my boat uh, is also a little bit my second home and uh, my second office. Uh, I got into the habit of uh, working there during the lockdowns, the COVID lockdowns in France uh, during the last two years. And now I am continue to regularly go there and sell and work and do maths at the same time. And it's very nice. So if one day you do not see me anymore, this is just I, I decided to bet. <laughs> you have fled on your boat. <laughs> I yeah. see. So for those of you who don't know Fred already, so beside uh, sailing, uh, he's actually a very successful researcher. He's a research director at INRIA, where he leads the Data Shape Research Group. So this group is known for being an important contributor to the development of TDA over the years, uh, and almost since the field's inception, I must say. So Fred himself has played a big role in this story, with his contributions that span the, the entire spectrum of the field, including its mathematical foundations, its algorithmic developments, its connections to statistics and to machine learning, all the way down to some of its industrial applications. Oh, by the way, Fred, I saw recently that you hit the 100th publication mark. That's, oh. that's quite a number. Really? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I saw I, it on the DLP. Uh, it, it's a lot. Uh, maybe I am going to retire. Uh, <laughs> well, I think you're too young for that. <laughs> but um, so this is a good opportunity for me to in, to ask the first real question, which is: Could you tell us a bit about your pu personal publishing policy? Mm, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so maybe I, I, I'm a bad example, but. Uh, I, I would say that we have some tendency to to publish too much, and um, this, this is a this is not a specific problem from our community. I think this is a general phenomenon, and um, in some sense there are more and more papers and more and more papers of uh, not so good quality that we see uh, not only in our fields but in I think in all fields, and uh, most of them look like. Uh, unfinished works or uh, in the worst case, they contain serious flaws. And I think this is not good for, uh, in some sense, for science in general. But uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to make a lot of friends by saying this. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, I, I think this is not, um, we should not complain uh, about the researchers to have this behavior. I think this is more 
a kind of general pressure from the academic system that encourage and almost sometimes force people to publish a lot because uh, it's difficult, for example, for young researcher, it becomes more and more difficult to, to get a, a position if you don't have a certain number of publications. And uh, I think that's one of the problem we have. So I, I, I'm not saying that I'm a good example because uh, I, I publish quite a lot. But when I, I'm publishing, I, I, I'm trying to follow, uh, to have some kind of publi uh, publishing policy and I'm trying to follow a few principles. So maybe the first one is that uh, in general, when I think about publishing a paper, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to publish work uh, uh, that I'm really proud of. So uh, I'm always asking myself the question, will I be happy uh, in two or three years when I will reread this paper? And uh, I think that's a good habit to try to, to think a little bit about this before publishing a paper. But uh, to be honest, I have to say that I'm not necessarily proud with all my papers. And um, sometimes we, uh, as you have probably seen, I'm publishing a lot with co-authors. I don't. I'm not a fan, or a big fan of uh, single paper, uh, single author papers. I like to to work and publish with collaborators and friends and so on. And uh, sometimes when you publish in particular in uh, different communities, communities we are not used to, it we need to make some compromise. Uh, and to accept to publish some papers that we would not have published in some other places. Uh, another point I'm, uh, I, I, I try, uh, or thing I try to apply to myself when I'm publishing, I'm trying to be always very strict uh, with myself rega regarding uh, the mathematical rigor of the work and the correctness of the results on proof. I think this is import uh, of fundamental importance for uh, the development of TDM and of our field to maintain a high, le uh, high quality, ma high mathematical quality of uh, in our work. So yeah, if, always... you, if you allow me to uh, to yeah, interrupt yeah, sure. you for a second, I can I can uh, testify that you're strict only not only uh, with yourself but with your co-authors as well, and also with yeah. the authors of papers you review. I <laughs> remember. Okay. Uh, I experienced it once because you reviewed one of my papers once when we uh, were not uh, collaborating and uh, I knew afterwards that you were the reviewer and uh, and I remember we got two reviews for that paper. The first review was very positive and the guy was saying, okay, I don't see any problem with this paper. It can go to publication. And then the second review, so your review was saying, yeah, the ideas are good, but here's a list of things that should be improved. And then there was a six pages long list of things to, to change. And I must say that uh, at the end of the day, like I wouldn't say that all the remarks were so important. Some of them were a little bit nitpicking, but uh, many of them were actually very thoughtful. So I think this is a very good thing that you are maintaining this uh, rigor, uh, this you know, this uh, standard of rigor for yourself and also for your collaborators and your fellow researchers. Uh, is it a complaint? <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's no. It's a it's a compliment. It's a compliment. No, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that this is also the way we should. Uh... So, so, so sometimes we are authors, but we are all, often we are also uh, reviewers, and uh, we should also think about reviewing not as some kind of way to judge people, but rather as a process to help people to improve their, uh, their work. In particular, when you publish to journals, uh, it's not a shame to have iterations and uh, to have to resubmit or to re improve your paper before uh, being it published. And I think this is a role of the reviewers to help authors to improve their papers. Um, right. and maybe, okay, and maybe the last point regarding um, my publishing policy is that I make a clear distinction uh, between uh, conferences and journals. And uh, because I think it's not so clear uh, sometimes, but in, in my mind, conferences and conferences proceedings are good places to, to present uh, or publish ongoing works, uh, not well finalized ideas and things like that. So the, the, the goal of conferences is to stimulate the flow of ideas among the scientific communities. So I think this is a place where you can publish and present some uh, works that are not very well finished or that are still uh, ongoing. And on the other side, I think that journal uh, paper 
because the, the review process is not constrained by deadlines. And as, as we just said, uh, iteration with the reviewers are allowed, uh, are more adapt to uh, mature, mature and uh, more finalized work. So I, I try when I publish to a journal to publish things I'm very happy with and I consider as being finished in some sense. And uh, for conferences, it's a little bit different. You, the idea is to, to show some ideas, to promote some ideas, and you can be a little bit more uh, flexible. Right, uh, that, that makes sense. Um, so um, another question regarding your list of publications. When, when I look at it, um, and when I look back at your career as a mathematician, one thing that strikes me is the, the breadth and the variety of the subjects and areas that you've been contributing to over the years. So. Um, Without going into too much, too much detail, could you please try to briefly walk us through the sequence of these subjects and explain briefly again what led you to transition from one to the to the next? Um, okay, so, so maybe one thing I have to confess, as uh, maybe unlike uh, other mathematician, I did not get interested in mathematics when I was uh, a teenager or a young child. Uh, my interest in uh, maths came uh, pretty lately. In fact, after high school, after uh, almost two years of uh, the university of class preparator, which is some kind of first year of universities in France. And uh, before, I, I, I was really not very interested and I did not see the interest in maths. So uh, sometimes things come a bit later, you need to be a bit mature. And I started to get interested in, um, in math. Uh, because I, I had at that time uh, a great professor who uh, showed me that in fact math was not just a, a, a list or, or a sequence of um, unrelated uh, separate topics, uh, but um, he, he was able to learn me math in a kind of global and current way, and he showed me that in fact math is just a set of, there are many topics, many fields, subfields in math, many subdomains, but in fact, they are all connected to each other. And uh, uh, traveling through the math world is a little bit like traveling on a graph and uh, where the nodes are sort of topics and uh, edges are the connections between the topics and discovering new connection between different nodes is, uh, was very exciting. So this is a time when I started to, to be interested in math. And in fact, I was interested in all aspects of math. And uh, I was just seeing it at that time as some kind of um, amazing and stimulate uh, intellectual uh, playground. So I decided to go in math, uh, in pure math, in fact. I was, um, and I, I did a PhD in pure math. In, uh, for the one who know, it was a PhD in real analytic geometry. I was studying some uh, specific kind of foliation that were related to dynamical systems. So it, it was very far away in some sense from what I'm doing now, but all along my uh, university years and during my PhD, I always been interested uh, and curious about all the aspects of mathematics, trying to learn from uh, uh, other students, from, from other professors, and to keep an eye on uh, different aspects of mathematics. And this was also including applications of mathematics. And uh, after my PhD, I got a position uh, in a pure math lab in Burgundy in France. And at the very beginning uh, of my career, I, I continued and uh, to more seriously look at some other uh, fields than the one I was working on during my PhD. So uh, I made a small travel towards complex analysis at some point because uh, I found it uh, quite uh, interesting and exciting. I was also looking, uh, I think it was at the beginning of the century, roughly. And I was also starting to look at some more applied field because I, I wanted to do some applications too. So I've been uh, looking a little bit at, at that time at number theory on cryptography, at quantum computing. This was in some sense, a big, it was, a, this was the beginning of the, this field at the, this time they were uh, quite uh, popular and uh, I was interested in the mathematical aspect of this field. I didn't do anything. So I, I, I spent some time uh, learning about this field, but I, I did not uh, succeed to do anything interesting uh, in this area. And then I met a famous, uh, I don't know if he was 
a computer scientist or a, a mathematician, a guy who was named Philippe Flagellet. And uh, I started to also to work on analysis of algorithm. And there I, I got, I had a few contribution in this uh, domain with a group of Philippe Flagellet. And at the same time, uh, I also, uh, uh, I also start, uh, initiated and started my first in real industrial collaboration with various companies. And uh, one specificity of this collaboration is that they were uh, focusing on applied differential on uh, Riemannian geometry and, and also some statistical aspect related to that. So I think it was a little bit the beginning of my interest to for applied uh, topology on geometry. Yeah. So I see also and, that in, the, in those early days, you you were already interested in applications and uh, collaborations with industrial. So uh, this will be the subject of, a, of another question. But just, okay, uh, yeah, so we can uh, develop a little bit more. Already. Okay. okay, so please proceed. And, okay, and maybe it's a big change that uh, made me, made me move to what CDA was uh, in 2002. I met uh, Jean-Daniel Bosna, who was your uh, PhD advisor. And uh, during a summer school or a winter school, I don't remember. And uh, I started to be interested in computational geometry. Uh, I started to discuss with him, with his group. I think, that, I don't know if at that time you were already a PhD student in the group of Jean Daniel, or if you just arrived a little bit later. I think it was in 202 or something like that. Yeah, I started my PhD in 202. So uh, I okay. probably wasn't there at the summer school, but uh, I had just so, started. I, I started to, 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 to look at some question uh, related to comp computational geometry. And this was the beginning of the, the work we initiated uh, in the geometric and topological inference. And I think this is a moment where I, I really started to move toward uh, TDA. At that time, we were not talking about TDA, but uh, I think this, for me, this was the beginning. I see. And so when you transitioned to TDA, what was your, uh, your perspective on the subject? So, Maybe to end the story, uh, uh, the transition uh, at this at that time or a little bit later, I moved to Inria. Mm -hmm. so it was in 2006, so it was 15 years ago, 16 years ago. 2007, and, uh, I think. Inria. Uh, yeah, I I I I, I spent yeah. one year alone at Inria, and then you. Oh arrived. yeah, that's right. Yes, right. in 2007 we were both uh, at Inria in Orsay, and uh, I think we were interested in. Uh, in geometric inference, topological inference, to uh, provide some theoretical guarantees on uh, for some uh, so for some uh, computational geometry algorithm, in particular reconstruction theorem, where this theor we were interested in proving that some algorithm to reconstruct uh, 3D shapes or uh, sometimes higher dimensional shapes uh, were mathematically well founded. And um, so that, that, that was the question we had in mind. Uh, and at the more general level, I remember I was thinking, and I think you were thinking more or less of the same thing when mm -hmm. you arrived. We were thinking about the idea of uh, what, can, what can we say about the geometry of shapes or objects we just know through a finite set of points or through an, uh, uh, an approximation. And surprisingly, at that time, uh, these questions were uh, almost uh, completely unexplored, except for a few results uh, in computational geometry to, to prove the correctness of some uh, reconstruction algorithm, that they have not been uh, considered from a, a pure mathematical perspective or from a general perspe mathematical perspective. So um, this, I, I think, uh, was in some sense uh, my, my perspective on the subject. And uh, at that time, I have to say also that we had a very uh, deterministic view on the topic. We were not really interested in statistics or right. aspect, but as we were just arriving uh, in Orsay, uh, we met uh, people who are uh, in statistics at Orsay. So in, uh, in Orsay, here from Paris, there is a very nice mathematical department, a great mathematical department, and in particular, there is a very strong group in statistics. And we had the chance to meet some uh, nice statistician, in particular, one famous statistician who is named uh, Pascal Massa. And we started to have some discussion. And then we realized that 
maybe what, all what we were doing with a computational geometry application in mind could be useful too for uh, data sciences and, uh, and could be combined with statistics. And I think uh, that was also the beginning uh, of uh, what we developed uh, on the statistical side of TDA on geometric inference. And uh, this, uh, just to, to, to conclude, because I don't want to spend too much time on that, but um, this meeting with uh, statisticians in Orsay, in particular with Pascal Massa, has been extremely fruitful. For example, with Pascal, since uh, during the last 15 years, we have always, we have always been co-advising a PhD student. Some of them were uh, or are uh, very, very good. And uh, we also have share postdoc and things like that. So we are we now have a, a long-standing collaboration with statistics uh, in Orsay, and I think that this has been very fruitful to, yeah, to us yeah. uh, and hopefully to yeah. the, a little bit to the field. I actually remember these uh, first few uh, uh, meetings that we had with Pascal. He was even more excited than we were. He was he had a vision. He was going his vision was going beyond ours at that time. So I think it was very yeah, very yeah, good surprise. So. Yeah. So, and at the time, so you were transitioning from well-established topics, either in mathematics or in computer science to some only emerging topic, which was TDA. So did you see that as a potentially dangerous move for, for your career as a mathematician? Uh, I think at that time, I, 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 I did not see it as a, I, I did not realize that it could have been a, a, a dangerous move. Uh, maybe by chance, uh, at the time, I already had a permanent position. And uh, this is one of the specificity, I think, of the French system that people can get permanent position when they are still very young. And um, of course, moving to, towards a new or an emerging field is always a, a risky bet. But at least it, it's a scientific uh, risk. It's not a real personal risk. Uh, it, it can, in some sense, slow down your career, your professional career. But personally, there is no risk that you don't get a position at the end if you don't success. So uh, I think that this has been a chance, uh, even if I, I was not realizing it at that time, to, to have a permanent position in a system that was not uh, too constraining, that was leaving us a lot of freedom. So we have been able to work on these new topics quite freely without having any uh, pressure of uh, publication, etc., And I think that's something very important because when you move from one top subject to another one, in particular, if this is an emerging one and not well-developed one, it may uh, happen that you spend a few years without really publishing or having a significant contributions. And uh, having an ecosystem that protects you from any personal risk when you do that is something which is great and uh, I have to acknowledge to, to the French system. Yeah, but, well, uh, I can testify for this as well because I was a young researcher just hired by Ingria at the time and I had a permanent position. Yeah, I, I remember. So I could yeah, afford I, to take the, the risk as well. Yeah, and I remember we had this uh, very nice period where we were just uh, working, thinking of uh, what we were interested in and uh, progressing. Yeah, without having to worry about uh, what's going to happen when uh, our uh, for, for our to, to our career. Yeah, that's true. But that uh, on nice. the, and uh, on the other side, uh, it was risky. But I think that the risk is the essence of research. If you don't take risks in re when you are doing research, probably you don't uh, you you don't have many chances to right. to do very exciting things or to to go to our new new really new things. Right. So uh, looking back, so then you started working in TDA. Uh, you've been working in this topic for 15 years. So looking back, what in your view have been, say, the most important milestones in the development of the field, either on the mathematical side or on the CS side? Uh, so I, I'm not sure I'm very qualified to, to tell what are the important uh, milestones, but I will give you uh, my response that is, of course, biased by uh, my personal view on that, probably incomplete. I will probably miss something. But uh, I think that 
important milestone, um, one uh, obvious important milestone is uh, emergence of persistent homology. I think this is the time when we, uh, when I, 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 I'm saying we, I, I mean the community, the, the TDA, or the, the very young at the time, uh, TDA community, so it mm -hmm. means many, uh, several people in different countries, realize that multi-scale approaches for topological and geometric inference are really the right way to uh, consider geometric inference on a topological inference problem. So I think the time we realize that um, it is a, it's not a good idea to try to look things at a single scale, but to have some kind of multi-scale U is really one important, I think it, it really changed the perspective we had on the uh, topic. And this happened at the same time uh, for persistence because I think the emergence of persistence is a work of uh, uh, Herbert Desbonneur and uh, Zomorodian and Gunnar, etc. All these people. And on our side, I think we were less focused on persistence, but maybe more on uh, geometric inference and distance-based approaches where we also realized that it was better not to look at a single sub-level set of distance function, but at the wall filtration, etc. And I think this, this has been an important milestone, milestone uh, in my perspective. Another uh, important milestone uh, for me was when we also started to think about uh, point clouds on data as measure, not only as just point cloud. When we started to, to have this, uh, 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 how to say that? Uh, statistical view? Mm. This statistical view and things like that. And I think, the, uh, and more generally, the emergence of statistics in TDA has also been an important milestone because it also opened the door toward uh, all this uh, work we see now uh, at the crossing between uh, TDA and ML machine learning or AI because uh, there are some very strong connections and a very interesting uh, result mixing TDA and statistics. And uh, there is still a lot of uh, things to do in this uh, direction. Uh, I'm also quite amazed by the algebraic and category aspect of the persistence. So I'm no longer follow this direction very closely, but I, I, I'm really amazed by the development, the theoretical development that persistence has known and uh, towards fundamental mathematics, something uh, really striking. Uh, I think uh, maybe a last milestone, and I will stop because I could list you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> many, many others, but another very important, I think, for, for TDA and for the TDA community uh, has been the development of the algorithmic aspects mm -hmm. of TDA and the emergence of uh, efficient uh, TDA or applied topology, computational topology libraries, because they have been essential to develop the applications. I, I remember when we were working uh, 15 years ago in TDA or a little bit more, there were no uh, available implementation of persistence on things like that. So I remember when we were talking to, to statisticians or applied people, people were saying, okay, that looks uh, interesting, nice, and these are uh, beautiful mathematics, but uh, it's not clear that we can really use it on uh, our problem with our data that are very large, etc. So may, I think may the effort that I've been made. Uh, Sorry, uh, Fred, may I, may I contradict yeah, yeah, you just a bit here? There was, there was Plex, right? The Plex lab. Yeah, yeah. Remember. Uh, Plex had a very nice tutorial. I think it was uh, Vin de Silva who wrote it. So that was very nice for, for introducing people to, to the field, actually, and to the, the, the techniques. But it's true that Plex at the time was not really very scalable. And that, I think that was really what was missing to, to really convince people uh, yeah. down, I, I, doing applications downstream. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. So I remember Plex was there, and that was a great thing. So I, I would say that was a great thing uh, for us, for computational geometry or for uh, right. people in applied topology. But uh, the, the problem was scalability. And I think that there have been a lot of efforts made to improve uh, this and to get algorithms that are efficient. And uh, this has been a real uh, contribution and a lot of work. It not, was not just a matter of having a more powerful, powerful computers or things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a real uh, theoretical uh, contribution which is behind all this. 
Uh, maybe so I, I, I I'll stop here, but I, I think I probably missed some uh, important point or milestone, and uh, maybe one thing is that also um, it's difficult. I think it's still uh, too early to to decide or to have a clear view uh, on what are the really important milestones in the field. This is still a, uh, a young field, and I, I think that right. mid or long time is in general the good judge for uh, to decide what are the important part uh, or the important milestone or uh, contribution uh, in a, a given domain. So let's wait for a few more years. And when you will be uh, interviewed as a senior researcher, you'll probably be able to answer this question uh, <laughs> better than me. So, yeah, well, okay. So speaking of this, um, like the fact that some years are required, are necessary to see uh, what is really, what was really important as a development and what was not, maybe not, didn't have so much of an impact. So, I mean, the, the field of TDA is now developing in so many different new directions, uh, many of which look exciting. Um, so I want to ask you, do you think that, I mean, among all these directions, do you have any per personal tastes? And are these tastes driven by, for instance, whether you think there is a, a true potential in a given direction. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe maybe, maybe giving you my uh, preferences mm -hmm. <laughs> before giving you uh, my, my preferences. I just want to say something about the fact that um, TDA is developing in a number of directions. So just want to say that this is something that I find amazing about TDA. Um, that the fact that this it is developing in many uh, directions. And this, this has been made because um, there is a, a, a real well-structured, uh, growing enthusiastic and multidisciplinary scientific community uh, around TDA. And that's not so common in mathematics that uh, you can find places or community where there are people doing statistics, probabilities, algorithms, uh, category theory, or uh, whatever you want. And, uh, I find uh, really nice that all these people continue to talk to each other and to develop the field and to have some exchanges. So just, just something I wanted to mention about uh, the community. And uh, regarding my um, preferences, my personal preferences, uh, I try, I am very curious about all the directions taken by uh, TDA and computational topology, but there are so many now that it is almost impossible to to closely follow them. So I, I'm trying to keep an eye on uh, the different aspect of TDA, but uh, I have to say that this last, uh, recent, during the recent year, my interest moved quite a lot towards uh, the connections between TDA, statistics, and uh, machine learning. And uh, I, I, I really like, I, I think it's important because uh, data science is are becoming more important uh, in, in all domains uh, of sciences and uh, also in economic domains. So I think it's important to, to try to contribute to data sciences through TDA. And uh, I'm very interested in also in the mathematical questions that are raised by, this, uh, uh, by the development of data sciences and AI. And uh, I strongly believe that uh, topological and geometric approaches can bring something very interesting to, 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 to these emerging fields of uh, data science in AI. Uh, and uh, I, I also like this because there have been a very interesting evolution of TDA, I think during the last uh, maybe five years uh, toward machine learning. So I remember when we were trying to do uh, machine learning with TDA maybe five or six years ago, the idea was, or to apply it to the idea, yeah. we were using it as some kind of uh, feature engineering tool. So we are saying we have some data, some complex data. From this data, we try to extract some uh, topological features in general given by persistence, and then to incorporate them in, in some uh, standard uh, machine learning pipeline. So that was already great. But uh, in the last few years, we have seen some changes in the way TDA was uh, trying to uh, interact with machine learning. So we have seen some work where TDA was used in some sense to in improve, to try to improve uh, machine learning models, to improve the models themselves, not just to uh, 
uh, extract feature, but also to, to improve models. And uh, even more recently, it seems that there are some, I, I saw different uh, promising work where um, TDA can, uh, or I, I, at least topological approaches seems to be relevant to try to better understand and monitor the way uh, machine learning or more generally AI systems work or, or do not work in some cases. So I, I'm very enthusiastic about this uh, research direction because uh, I think we can bring some very uh, significant contribution to, to these fields. Right, I agree. I, agree. I think all the other fields uh, are of great interest. And, uh, this shift is very interesting, right? In uh, the way TDA has been applied uh, to other areas, in particular to machine learning, is, is I think, very interesting. Um, yeah. Will it make an impact uh, down the road? Huh, who knows? Only the future will tell. I mean, how far yeah, the yeah, impact yeah. will go, how big the impact will be. I would say that it already impacts uh, a few. TDA now has some applications. It does, it uh, does. But if you look at, and, for instance, the ICML, or, uh, ah. the ICML or NIPS list of papers, you know, the, the papers dealing with TDA are still a very small number among those. Yeah, but at, at least I think now we, there is some kind of sub-community among these uh, machine learning communities of people who uh, are doing and publishing papers in TDA and ML. So mm. that's a good point. And... Uh, uh, on the application side, real application side, I think we see every day more and more uh, applications of TDA. Right. There is yeah. always this discussion about uh, uh, is it, was it really necessary to do TDA or was it possible to do it differently? But um, I would say uh, there is some kind of uh, diffusion of TDA towards uh, applications too, towards academic right. uh, community, um, but also towards applications, including mm -hmm. industrial applications. Right, I, I agree that, and I agree with you that one of the strengths of TDA for the future is that it's a very, very active, very uh, energetic community. And this is in part thanks to the fact that we have so many young researchers involved in the field. Uh, like I myself, I'm 40, 42, 43, and I consider myself as an old timer in the field. Um, like this says something about uh, you know the, our community, uh, the fact that it's young and very uh, excited and. Uh, this, I think, is a very good thing for the future. So speaking of the future, uh, so, like assume that you said earlier that I would be interviewed in 10 years. I would say I would prefer to have you interviewed again in 10 years. So I don't know. That's a question for Henry and uh, Elhana. Is this something possible? Like, can someone be interviewed twice? Uh, I need to look at my agenda, too. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We will see. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, I, there must be a minimal amount of time in between interviews, uh, uh, I assume. Um, so um, yeah, so let's say you're interviewing 10 or 15 years from now. So what are your hopes? What do you expect to be saying about the field at that point? Uh, and what are your, more precisely, what are your hopes and fears about the evolution of the field in the meantime? Uh, it's... It's a difficult question. I, uh, I'm, uh, uh, reading in the future is not something which is easy in general. Right. And as this interview is recorded, I, I, I am not going to take too much risk. I don't want to have problems in 15 yeah. years. Yeah. It's a so, tricky question. indeed, I, I don't have any uh, real fear. I think the field is now pretty well established. There is, a, as you just said, a very a dynamic uh, community, many young researchers interested in the field. It becomes very attractive. And um, maybe there is a rather a couple of things I think we should all, always or con always continue to take care of. And among these things, uh, I, I, I think we, 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 we should be very uh, careful with uh, the, 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 the beautiful and nice things of TDA. In particular, maintaining strong connection between all aspects of TDA, uh, the mathematical and theoretical aspects, the algorithmic aspects, the application, etc. Uh, there are so many developments that one strength, I think, of, uh, of TDA now is that uh, there is a kind of homogeneous community. So you see people from very different uh, origin and field, 
who are some who are trying. I think that it's important to build and to maintain some kind of common culture, scientific culture around TDA, and also to maintain its uh, diversity of uh, of uh, fields and domains that contribute to TDA. So that's some things we should not lose. And we uh, one maybe one. I think it's a small risk, not a real, but would be to 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 have some kind of uh, splitting of the, the TDA community and TDA into one branch that would be uh, only interested in very mathematical aspect and stop to talk to people who are more on the algorithmic aspect, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's something we uh, we have to take care of. Um, I think another strength of TDA is that uh, it, in general, provides tools and methods that, are, uh, that usually comes with very strong and uh, sometimes deep mathematical guarantees. And uh, that, uh, you know that uh, very well, Steve, because we have discussed this uh, many times all along our collaborations. I think that it's not the same thing when you contribute. Uh, I'm talking, I'm thinking in particular in the data science aspect of uh, TDA. It's not the same thing that when you propose just a heuristic method that work on some uh, few examples or on some uh, specific use case. And when you try to propose a method that comes with some mathematical guarantees that try to uh, help you to understand what you are doing, etc. So uh, continuing to develop TDA with this habit to, to, to always consider the mathematical and theoretical aspect of the field, I think is very important. We, this is something which is already existing in the community because I think most of the community is issued from the math community or theoretical uh, computer science community, or this is quite usual. But with the development of uh, some kind of almost anarchical uh, development of uh, applications, we have to be careful that uh, the core of TDA remains uh, mathematically strong mm -hmm. and relevant. Uh, another risk I may see is a risk of being uh, uh, over optimistic about TDA or to, to believe that TDA alone can solve real problems. Uh, in my experience, I do not know uh, any real applied problem where TDA is the only tool to solve the problem. Sometimes we hear this kind of thing that some people who are uh, a bit too optimistic about TDA and things that we can, uh, including people who do not know TDA. They are just, uh, they don't know the field, but they think that topology can solve everything. So we have to, to be aware that uh, this is probably not the case. There is no universal tool to solve all the problems, but uh, we should take care not to forget about this. And uh, maybe on a more uh, optimistic perspective, uh, or to say that I'm quite confident about the fact that TDA will continue to develop, is that I think that uh, there is also a shift in data science in the nature of data. So we see, uh, we have access to more and more complex data and more and more structured data, where uh, each observation is itself, uh, may itself be a very complex uh, object. It can be a graph, it can be a 3D shape or um, even a higher dimensional shape. It can be the result of a simulation of a complex dynamical system. It can be, we see more and more high dimensional time series. And all this uh, complex data carries some uh, structure and complex structure. And I think that TDA can provide the right tools to understand these things and process them in, uh, in data analysis or machine learning pipeline. So, uh, with the, the increase in the complexity of the data we are able to, to collect, uh, I'm quite confident about the future of TDA in this direction. Uh, That's good to hear. Yeah. So, um, if I may, I'd like to move on to a couple of questions that are not directly TDA related. Um, this gives me an opportunity to say, to mention that in addition to doing your research, you are also the director of an institute, the Data IA Institute in Paris-Saclay, which is the leading ecosystem in AI in France. So could you tell us a bit about it? Uh, yes. So um, indeed, Data, data IA is uh, the Institute uh, for Data Science and AI of the World University uh, Paris-Saclay. So this is an institute uh, that involves uh, more than uh, 1,000 permanent research staff. 
So this is a pretty big institute. Uh, it is in charge of uh, all the aspects uh, of AI and data sciences uh, for the University of Paris-Saclay, which means we are in charge of uh, driving our research, but also teaching and also industrial partnership. And uh, one year and a half, I uh, accepted to take the position of uh, the director of this institute. So I was not realizing what I was doing at that time. Maybe the people who saw me, the, <laughs> the, the position <laughs> uh, were good sellers. <laughs> sellers. And um, so that, that's the kind of second job I have now. <laughs> But it's a very exciting experience as a scientific. I'm not going to talk about all the administrative and political aspects and activities that are related to, to such a position. But on the scientific side, uh, what I find uh, and what I like is that it gives an incredible view, wide view, on many researches and challenges in data science in AI. And these challenges uh, go from uh, fundamental mathematical challenges, fundamental math, to very applied sciences. So this is a, a research institute that uh, gather people from uh, math, physics, biology, medicines, but also some lawyers and uh, people in humanities. So there is a wide range of uh, activities and research projects we have to, to see on the, uh, so this, this is, I think, very, very exciting to, to, and in some sense, with respect to, to my small field of TDA, uh, it gives me some kind of uh, larger view, and uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting to have this, uh, this view. It also gives me the opportunity to discuss and meet with many academic and industrial researchers. So, uh, and as much as I can, I try to talk sci about sciences with them. <clears throat> and, um, from a personal perspective, I learn a, a, a lot from these exchanges and discussions. Uh, I learn about uh, scientific fields I, I even didn't know before. Uh, I think it's also interesting when you, you have the chance to, 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 to have such a position, to look at problems from other people, to try to understand them, and to bring uh, your uh, own a perspective on it. So my own perspective is to try to, every time I'm talking about uh, science with uh, some of these people or some of these uh, people who have some project, I try to think of, uh, ask the question, is it possible to bring something to their problem or to help them by uh, bringing some topological or geometric ideas? And sometimes we have some very nice uh, exchanges about this. And also sometimes this is a good opportunity to start new collaboration. And, uh, and maybe a last point, uh, which is more related to TDA and our community, is that I'm quite surprising and I find it very rewarding to see that more and more people outside from our community are aware of our heard about uh, applied topology on TDA as a potentially uh, useful technology. So sometimes I meet people who are using TDA in their research or in their uh, companies. And also sometimes when I tell people that, okay, I'm the head of the Data Institute, but I'm also a researcher working on TDA. And sometimes people tell me, oh, you are working in TDA. I heard about it. I would be very interested in uh, uh, learning about it. And uh, I saw that some people are doing some very nice thing with TDA. I'm wondering if it would be possible in my setting to also do TDA, et cetera. So this is very interesting. And in some sense, I think it's very rewarding for the TDA community to see that we succeeded to, to, to start to, to disseminate create. TDA. Uh, yeah, and create some hype of, on yep, yep. The, the topic, right. So um, another question, um, which is about your industrial collaboration. So um, you have in the past, and even including the recent past, uh, led some several, like several very successful collaborations with industrials. And uh, I want to mention two examples. So one with, uh, with, with Fujitsu, which is a big company, and another one with a smaller company, a French tech company called Cisnam. So can you explain us how these collaborations, maybe these ones in particular, or more generally your industrial collaborations have impacted your research? And in your view, if such uh, you know, collaborations with industrials could potentially help shape the future developments in TDA? 
Um, so I, 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 as I said uh, at the beginning uh, or previously, I've always been curious and interested in uh, industrial problems and applications of science to industrial problems or, uh, non, or in non-scientific fields. And I started to have industrial collaboration at the very beginning of my career. And I always tried to maintain um, such collaboration. Uh, one of the reasons is that I find these exchanges with industrial uh, very interesting and uh, very exciting because on one hand, if you succeed to apply what you are doing to a, a real industrial problem, you get some kind of very strong reward. I, I'm not talking about uh, money. Uh, I'm talking about uh, satisfaction. Uh, sa satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, when we you talk uh, talking with people who have a concrete problem in industry, etc., is a good way to get some ideas to develop or to explore some new, uh, more theoretical directions. So sometimes you talk with an industrial; he has a very concrete problem. And you try in some sense, as we are mathematicians, we try in some sense to bring this problem into our uh, world, mathematical world, to try to formalize this problem, to, to make some assumption, to try to formalize the question, etc. This activity is, uh, is interesting, but uh, it also raises, in general, some very inter uh, interesting uh, theoretical question. So for me, uh, having this collaboration as feel me in terms of uh, more academic uh, research direction. So it's very important for me to, to maintain them. And maybe uh, uh, another thing I, I, I'd like to mention about uh, this industrial collaboration, uh, I, I, I increase a little, uh, quite a lot, my involvement in the industrial collaboration, uh, I don't remember, five or six years ago. Uh, you probably remember this uh, well because we were working together at that time. And uh, an, uh, there was another motivation to do that at that time is that I was a little bit worried about the fact that TDA was in a period where we were making a lot of uh, mathematical uh, progress in TDA. We were publishing a lot of uh, mathematical results, but it was quite unclear how these, all these results could be uh, applied. There were uh, a few applications, etc. But I was thinking at the time that we needed to make a, a strong effort to try to promote TDA outside of academia and try to, to get some uh, success uh, in this direction. And uh, this is something uh, we have done. We have I have pushed a lot towards this. We had the chance at that time to meet uh, Fujitsu, the Fujitsu company you mentioned. And we started with them a, a long-term collaboration. So now we have been collaborating for five years. And uh, I think uh, th 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 I, this is a really great company. They have a, an amazing perspective on industrial collaboration, on, uh, on, on collaboration with academia in AI. And uh, they also have a very good approach with respect to uh, research when they collaborate with academic people. They are very open-minded, they, uh, they like open research, so they like to publish, they like to uh, us to produce open source software, etc. So this is really great. And I think they probably have been the first big international multinational uh, company to be deeply convinced that there is a real interest in developing TDA uh, or, or, or as, a, as a technology that could be useful for AI and uh, data science. And I think, uh, up to, so we are, we are continuing to work with them. We are publishing, regularly publishing uh, some papers, but we are also working on more concrete problem. We have some patents. And uh, I think there is some kind of small success in this direction where, uh, but uh, this, I think this has been a, a, a really great opportunity to meet uh, Fujitsu at that time and to start this uh, collaboration. And uh, we are all together trying to, to push uh, TDA toward uh, TDA. There are also many other places and many other paper, people who are doing this now. And, uh, but the, for, 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 for me and for uh, the data shape team at Inuya, I think this has been a, a great opportunity. And yes, uh, maybe I think, just. I think from the data shape point of view, yeah, this was really uh, where uh, applications on our end like skyrocketed. Um, because to be fair, you know, there, had, there was already 
like a number of groups that were, who were doing very successful applications. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and there was also ISD, right, out there. Uh, yeah, of course, ISD. A company yeah, based I, on CDI I, technology, so. I, 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 ISD was born. Uh, I, I was meaning mm -hmm. Fujitsu was maybe the first uh, multinational uh, company who, who, who came to us. In fact, they came to us. We didn't go right, to they them. Uh, mm -hmm. They came to us and they said that we heard about TDA. Uh, some of our researchers started to work on TDA, and we have some conviction that this is one of the important technology for the future. So when an industrial come to you and tell you this, you cannot, you have to collaborate with him. You, you are very proud and uh, you say yes to everything. <laughs> uh, okay. And maybe one right. quick word about uh, the, the other company you mentioned, which is Cisnav. It's a different uh, collaboration. Cisnav is a French uh, SME. It's a fast growing one. I have a long-standing collaboration with them, but not only on uh, TDA. So uh, we have been working uh, with this company. I've been, we have been co-advising several PhD students on various topics and challenges they have. Uh, they are all related to the analysis of data that are issued from uh, inertial and uh, magnetic sensors. But we are not only doing uh, TDA. The idea is not, I, I think this collaboration is a bit different from the one with Fujitsu. This is a collaboration where we have an industrial partner. He has some problem. And we try to think all together about their problem. And the goal is to solve the problem. So when we can use TDA, we use TDA. But if we have to use some other tool, we, I, I take it as a good opportunity to learn some other uh, mathematics or methods. And uh, we have had also quite a few uh, success mm -hmm. with this company. Uh, Right. And we, uh, of course, we have also some other uh, collaboration. Uh, I, I, as you probably right. understood, I, 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 I'm a big fan of these uh, long-standing collaboration with uh, companies. Mm -hmm. As long yeah, as the they have some, some, uh, uh, as long as they are in a good uh, spirit, uh, don't try to steal your result or something like that. They really mm -hmm. want to you to 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 make some progress. Mm -hmm. And the two ones that you have been developing here in the interview are really emblematic of uh, you know, the interactions that uh, DataShape has had over the years with industrials, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's time to wrap up. So let me ask a final question. So in your view, uh, in, from your experience as a researcher, do you have any, like since we have so many young researchers in our, in our area, so do you have any specific recommendations to make to them? And maybe also to their advisors for those of them who are in, at PhD level. And also, like, there are also many mathematicians, for instance, who want to enter the field, people from pure mathematics who would like to enter the field. So what advice could you give to each of these different types of people? So um, first, I, I have to say that I, I'm not a big fan of uh, recommendation to you researchers. And probably one of the reasons uh, for that is that when I was a young researcher, if a senior researcher like me now had given me some advices, I would probably have done exactly the opposite. So <laughs> I don't know if it's a good idea <laughs> for me to give some advice, but um, if I had any way to give some uh, kind of uh, soft recommendation uh, to young researchers, but also to, to colleagues uh, who would like to enter in the field, one is that um, it's important to always be curious, mm -hmm. not only in what uh, you are doing. Not, it's important not to be too focused on your own very specific research. It's very important to learn from uh, the others, from uh, other branch of maths, and sometimes even from the other uh, sciences. So that's something that seems to be a little bit obvious, but uh, sometimes it's good to remind it. And uh, as an advisor, I, I, I would not, I, I, I don't consider myself uh, as a good advisor. I try to do my best to be uh, as good as I can. Uh, so I, I would not give a, a recommendation, but what I'm trying to do as an advisor, as a PhD advisor or in term, but maybe let's say a PhD advisor is to try to leave as much freedom as possible to my PhD students. So I'm not trying to constrain them to, in, to, to um, specific topics, etc. If they are curious of things and if they have some good ideas, 
I let them to go toward these good ideas, as long as they are doing some good science. And when we are discussed, something I, I'm always trying to do, I, I'm not claiming I, I, I'm success uh, always, because this is something which is not so easy to do, but uh, when we are discussing about the research direction and projects, I always try to propose and never to impose. That's also something that is obvious to, to tell, but sometimes in practice, uh, as we have some kind of uh, hierarchical relationship with them, uh, we have to be careful not to be too directive. Sometimes uh, good PhD students have better ideas than the one you have and can go in some uh, more right. clever direction. That's for sure. So we, we have to, even if we are the advisor, so we have to be modest and uh, to, in some sense to, to give freedom to, the, to our students. Um, so I think that's maybe a good, uh, and for other colleagues from pure math uh, who would like to, to enter in the field, uh, I don't have any recommendation, just would like to say that uh, they are very welcome. And if they, and uh, they should come with the ideas, with their knowledge, with their techniques, and uh, by this discussing with people in TDA, I'm pretty sure that this will lead to some uh, nice uh, development applications. Yeah, let, let me maybe uh, uh, guide you a little bit for this question. So um, sometimes people from pure math find it difficult to find where the frontier in the field is, where the important questions are in the field. So do you have any, any particular remark to phrase about this or recommendation to make about this? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, maybe uh, one thing for, uh, when you are in, math, in fundamental math in general, uh, you are working in some fields that have a long history and uh, the important questions are uh, rather well identified and uh, uh, in some sense, right. uh, important problems are well known, etc. So in some sense, you have some kind of guide. And I think with TDA, I don't, uh, myself, I don't know exactly where is the frontier. And I don't know if it's even a very interesting question. Um, but uh, in some sense, we, we have to build the field on the important question as we are going on. Um, I, I, uh, a moment ago, I tell you what was some important, uh, some problem I was considering as important and some uh, things we should work on, but I'm not sure that for the moment there are some kind of uh, big question or fundamental question that should be addressed uh, in the field. There are many different and uh, it's still a young uh, field, uh, but yeah, that's sure. also why it is exciting. Uh, if you want to enter into the field of TDA, uh, you don't need to learn for two years, uh, I don't know, algebraic geometry just to understand the question that you want to think about. You, you can directly enter into the field and uh, um, you can also build your own questions. Right, and finding the, the good questions is also part yeah, of Yeah, and the fi finding the good, the good question, the interesting question is part of the challenge. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And not the less interesting one. Yeah, I think that's a good conclusion. Uh, so uh, with this, I'll uh, head back to, I'll, I'll give the mic back to uh, Elhanan and I guess we'll take in the questions from the audience. Thanks so much. So I'll, I'll jump in before Elkanan, but uh, thank you, Steve, for all the questions and Fred for all the, the um, thoughtful answers. So Fred, I have a couple of questions from the audience and feel free to pass on any of these, on uh, any of these questions, but if, uh, if you'd like to say something, please do. So the, the first question, you said that when you were younger, you weren't so interested in math, but nevertheless, you, you found yourself, I believe, in this undergraduate math class where, you know, the instructor showed you the landscape of mathematics and the connections between. So why were you in this math class? What was the topics of the math class? And were you, were you maybe going to become an engineer? Or what, what route were you on at that point? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story. I, I don't know if it's a very... I the story. Uh, <laughs> still not a story, but okay. Um, you will see how we can, uh, how we can get to math. Um, to tell you the truth, when I was uh, in high school and at the beginning of... Uh, uh, 
I had a girlfriend, and uh, this girlfriend uh, uh, is now my wife. And I was a lot in love with her, and uh, this is still the case. And um, what I wanted to do at that time is that either doing some sport, so I was thinking of being a sport teacher or traveling around the world or some things like that, or, or, or medical doctor. So that was my two options I was thinking about. And uh, when we finished high school, my uh, girlfriend went to this uh, classes that are called uh, uh, class preparatoire, that are some kind of undergrad classes in maths. And uh, the beginning of the academic year in sport and medicine was one month later. So I decided to, to go there with her, and just to be with her. And I, I didn't have any motivation in mathematics and physics and these kind of things. And then I sat down there, and after one month, uh, I realized that I was in a classroom and uh, there was some heat. It was not cold, and uh, uh, I didn't have a great interest in maths, but uh, it was not uh, the uh, hell. And I was with my girlfriend, so I decided to stay. So that's the story. That's the true story. And um, this is how I. So, um, I don't know if it's a shame or not, but I didn't have any a priori uh, vocation or, or trend toward uh, mathematics. Well, that's beautiful, the, the importance of love. And, and, and you know the, the story after that. Mm -hmm. So the next question, I mean, you've, you've collaborated with so many different people in terms of working on research projects and papers or industry or students and, and co-advising. Um, and certainly this has been a, a huge benefit to, to a lot of the folks you have worked with, but, but do you find that these collaborations are, are partially helpful for, for developing your own ideas as well? Uh, I think they have been more helpful for me than for them. Uh, I really learned a lot about uh, my co-authors. Um, I also think that uh, doing research is, not, uh, is also some kind of uh, human adventure. And uh, what I like in, in our jobs and in what we are doing, we are doing things with a lot of passion. So I think uh, when you are in research, in academic research, you are doing that because you are passionate by what you are doing. And also because you meet some amazing um, people. And I really like this aspect. So in general, uh, I guess this is the same for many of us, but collaborators quickly become friends and uh, you exchange uh, you work together but you have some like, also some uh, more social activity together and uh, I think this is one of the nice aspects of uh, what we are doing uh, so I, I, I like to collaborate also for this reason I, I, I don't I'm not a mathematician mathematician who likes to be uh, in his, alone in his office all the day sometimes you need to be alone to work and to think about some things but when I have an idea in general, or, or what I think is to be an idea. You know, the first thing I try to do is that I go to knock on the door of a colleague or, uh, or, or I meet somebody in a conference and I start to discuss about this idea. And if uh, we have some kind of, uh, if we understand each other around this idea, then this leads to a collaboration. So, and in this way, I, I learn a, a lot uh, from my collaborators. And I would say that um, all the paper uh, I, I've published, where uh, almost all uh, I've been co-authored, and I, uh, I, I'm, uh, I think my, my, my collaborators have been essential to 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 to, to, to reach uh, this, to, to get this result, and to get this paper published. So there's a question about your relatively recent book with uh, Jean Daniel Bolsonaro and Mariette Ivanić. Uh, geometric and topological inference. So uh, what was the process for uh, producing this book? Do you, do you think of writing a book as quite differently, different process than writing a research paper? Or how did you all go about this together? I think, um, yeah, I think it's quite different because it's much more work. Uh, but I think there are also different ways to write a book. Uh, you can decide that on some topics, there is a need to have some book, and then you start to think about a book from scratch. For the book we had with Jean-Daniel and Mariette, 
the story was a little bit different. In fact, we were teaching a course in uh, computational geometry and a little bit of TDA in some master in Paris. And we have been teaching this course, uh, the three of us, for several years. And we have some course notes. Uh, each of us had its uh, own uh, notes. And at some point, we started to think um, that it could be nice to, to put all these notes together and to write a book. And it took us several years to, uh, to get at the end of the book. But the starting point was a three different set of notes with, uh, and uh, it has been a funny experience because we had our own notes with uh, each um, set of notes had its own notations. So we, I, I think we spent a lot of time trying to, uh, the, in some sense, the, the content of the book was here. The, most of the discussion were on the choice of the notations, for example, and to try to make the book homogeneous. And I remember a never-ending discussion we had on uh, how we should, uh, what kind of, what the notation we should use for words. And of course, when you have written all your notes, you are not very likely to change or to pass over all your uh, LaTeX file to change the notation of bones. So you try to argue uh, that uh, your notation is the best one. And we, we had a lot of fun doing uh, and funny discussion uh, to converge. But um, I think it's writing a book is much more work than writing a paper. It's longer and uh, it's a different experience. But it, so it's important to think about writing books uh, as the field progress, because people uh, people enter in the field from outside in general through books. In particular now, because there are so many papers in TDA, so that if you want to start to learn TDA from papers, you will clearly uh, I, you can imagine that somebody who doesn't know anything about TDA and decide to learn about TDA. If you start to find papers to learn TDA, you will quickly get lost. So I think it's important to have books as some kind of uh, milestone and uh, things to want, uh, um, kind of object to facilitate uh, the entrance into the, the field. So, so this next question is is based on the observation that there have been you know, for many years, a lot of strong theoretical and applied and uh, software contributions and industry contributions coming out of the TDA community in France. And, and you mentioned, you know, in particular that uh, as a young researcher, it sounds like both you and Steve were able to obtain permanent uh, positions as a young researcher. But, but the French system, at least for me, I don't, uh, I, you know, know how it compares or differs so well, although I know it is different. Are there any other aspects of the, of the French system or the community that you think helped uh, contribute to the, uh, all of these contributions in, in TDA coming, coming from France? Um, um, I don't see, I think this was really, the, for me, it was the main uh, thing is that, um, and the main, there are, there are some drawbacks in the French system. And I think this is not a place where we could discuss this, but I think on the positive side, the fact that you have a system where uh, pretty young people can get a permanent position. So, you know, we, things are changing. We are moving a little bit towards the North American system. So we start to have some kind of tenure tracks and things like that. But I would say when we started with Steve, this kind of tenure track position were not existing. After your postdoc, you were starting immediately with a permanent position. There are some drawbacks with that, but at least one positive thing is that once you have been hired, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen in three or five years from now. You, you're, you, you may, uh, it may take some time before you become a professor or the equivalent of a professor, which is a research director at NRIA. But in some sense, you are sure that we, you will continue to be paid. And, um, and there is not, a, a, and also I think it's part of the French uh, mathematical culture. People don't put you a lot of pressure uh, telling you that you have been hired to do that, to be in that team, to work on this specific project, etc. Uh, at least at, in RIA, when we arrived with Steve, 
uh, in some sense, we arrived just because some people were thinking that it might be interesting to have a team working on this aspect in the Paris area. And nobody, uh, and we discussed with people like Jean-Daniel Bolsana and some other people who were heading the Inria Center at that time, that no, none of them told us that you should do that, 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 or that. They just tell us that we think that it would be good to have some activities around these kind of topics, and they let us uh, do what we wanted to do. And they were very supportive, in fact. And uh, I think that's an amazing thing. I don't know if this would still be the case with, if we had to do that again now, 15 years later. But at that time, that was something uh, amazing. Uh, right. Propose, not, uh, not impose. So the, yeah, exactly. the, the final question, um, are there any perspectives or lessons learned from your passion for sailing and, and the sea? Ah, um, try not to get lost. Yes, that one thing. Also, um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not used to, to make a, a parallel or some comparison between. I think these are two different things. I like to sell. Uh, uh, yeah. There's a, there's a, I, I don't know if there are some kind of quality or, or, or skills that are comparable. Maybe the fact that when you are wind sailing, you have to be patient. If there is no wind, you have to, uh, you, you cannot give up. If you are in the middle of the sea, if there is a problem, you have to go ahead. And maybe this is something we, uh, which is also important when you are doing research. Sometimes, you are doing your research, you are working on your problems, and you have the, the feeling that everything is going wrong, that uh, you will never succeed, uh, and things like that. And maybe, uh, and it's important at that time not to give up to, sometimes it's important to give up when you realize that uh, you are on the end. But often it's important to, to continue, not to give up and to say, okay, I'm uh, going so across some difficult paths, uh, it's not a good time. I, I don't have very good feeling on what's going on, but uh, I should continue, and I, I, I need to find a way to, to reach my uh, objective. And when you are wind sailing, uh, you face also this kind of situation. Except that uh, when you are wind sailing, you cannot give up. You cannot jump into the water and swim back to the harbor. You have to bring your boat to the to the end. Okay, so let's bring this uh, interview back to the metaphorical harbor. That wasn't, that was, I didn't think that through enough. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thanks uh, a lot to Uda and Chazal for the incredibly interesting and engaging interview. You gave us a lot of uh, ideas to think about and reflect on. And also thank you to the audience uh, for joining today and for all of your thoughtful questions.